Hello. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our Supermarket 2030 talk. Uh, this event is part of the London College of Communication Postgraduate Showcase. And we hope that you've had a chance to discover some of the, the amazing work that's been done this year uh, in this particularly difficult year. Um, so Supermarket 2030 is a service design project which employed speculative design tools um, throughout the process and um, to guide the outcome. This project was uh, uh, created in collaboration with Buyback, which is a charity um, that helps to, that envisions to, ta tries to tackle childhood obesity uh, by 2030. It was also commissioned by the Social Design Institute, uh, which is part of, U of UAR. Um, this is again a service design project coming from the DMA service design um, but, and was created as part of the Global Design Future Unit. I am Marion Lachdemont. I am a lecturer um, especially for this unit, the Global Design Future, and uh, I was also assist, uh, helped a lot by Lara, Dr. Lara Salinas during this um, unit. After this talk, uh, please go and explore our students' portfolios and the amazing work they've done beside this project. And also feel free to uh, go and discover our Supermarket 2030 website, which is a bit of a weird experience, um, half immersive and half telling you about the process in itself. Um, before we start, I do have a few house rules to read to you. Uh, first off, this event is recorded and it will be made public on LCC on the LCC YouTube channel uh, within the next couple of weeks. By attending this live event, uh, you've agreed, uh, both guests and panelists have agreed to their contribution being captured and used for this purpose. We encourage you to ask questions into the Q&A um, throughout the entire talk as they come to you, and we will get, them to, uh, we'll get to them during that designated Q&A uh, part of the event. Our community guidelines have been uh, already posted in the chat and which expect all participants in virtual events to abide by. Please share your thoughts during, uh, during or after the event on the showcase and about on this event as well across social media and you can use uh, the hashtags RCC Postgrad Shows or SD Apocalypse, which is the MA service design hashtag for our show. Um, <clears throat> I will now uh, very shortly invite our Supermarket 2030 team to share their process and discuss the core elements of a project that is highly complex and particularly layered. Um, I really, really do love that work. Um, so without further ado, let me share them slides um, and the students will introduce their projects and work. Hi, everyone. Um, so firstly, I just wanted to take you on a little journey into the future. Imagine sitting on the London Tube or whatever public transport is in the area of the world you are um, in 2030. I know this might be a little bit hard at the moment, <laughs> imagining being on public transport. But you're sat there, you're feeling hungry after a day's work, and you remember that you've got a packet of crisps in your bag. You reached in but are suddenly hit by a kind of wave of shame and and doubt you're looking around the carriage and you're realizing that other people might see you and it's quite a busy carriage so unfortunately you take your hand back out of your bag and decide to just deal with the hunger and ignore it how would living in a world like this make you feel just have a think about that for a second so this kind of thinking ahead to what the future food environment might look like um, in 2030 was a brief given to us by Bite Back 2030, who, as Marion said, are a charity um, aiming to redesign the food system to better support young people's health. They believe that it's essential to think creatively about the whole system and the whole food environment um, that produces um, childhood obesity and the need to reframe this problem and to talk about it in a different way. Um, so they came to us and asked us to come up with a provocation um, for what the future of food might look like to kind of spark conversation and to get people thinking about that. So firstly, to tackle this brief, we introduced, um, we used this government forecasting to choose a future world to work within. 
Um, having the framework of the political, um, social and environmental background of a, of a future world, um, having that already defined made it really simple for us to kind of jump into and um, explore. The scenario we chose to work with, um, which Laura and other team members will take you through a bit um, in more detail later, um, it took us to a world with tighter government controls, um, a growing sense of community responsibility. Um, and in this world, each individual held this kind of um, civic responsibility to lead a healthy lifestyle so as not to put pressure on the National Health Service um, and also to help others to do the same. So what really drew us to choosing this scenario was this kind of nanny state angle which um, as it does kind of a normal political discourse have a lot of potential for provocation of um, discussion and arguments. So um, within this world where do we begin? Um, with the world developing at the rate it's currently going, um, how is it possible to predict how we'll be living in 10 years time? 10 years ago we were kind of still in this space where Instagram wasn't a thing um, and we were kind of, um, yeah, we had no idea what 2020 would look like, especially. Um, one thing we can do to try and um, kind of predict the future is use speculative design. So during this project, we were introduced to speculative design, um, which instead of focusing on creating, um, on kind of solving tangible present problems, finding solutions, is about imagining things that could be and creating a space for dialogue and kind of redefining um, our relationship with reality. Um, and it combines design thinking with world building to create artifacts that can use um, can be used to provoke discussion and debate. We used uh, speculative design in this context to explore a um, kind of dystopian trajectory that could result from um, this world having more government controls and a heightened sense of um, civic responsibility. Um, and it was a really interesting space to work in, especially as um, when we were doing this project in March 2020. Um, it was, we were kind of coming into this slightly dystopian um, COVID-19 lockdown um, anyway. So um, Laura will now tell you a bit more about our research and how it started. Thank you, Laura. So the first thing that we do uh, was to select the scenario, as Laura mentioned, and the scenario that called our attention was this a scenario that presented social responsibility going first, and then a society that anticipates and prepares for challenges. So we decided that the best way to summarize those, that the scenario was to create headlines. And that's what we did here that you are seeing right now. So we created a headline to represent the government regulation, a government that heavily regulates content of quality and quality of information shared by companies, but also by everyone to citizens. Uh, there is also a loss of trust on the food and drink sector and their ability to self-regulate. Therefore, heavy regulations on the content that they share are applied to them. Also, there is a lot of civic responsibility. This is a society in which individual responsibility and, and a civic do, is a civic duty to lead a healthy lifestyle and to encourage others to do the same. That's when we notice the shame aspect that could be a very good twist there. Um, and it's clear in the scenario that people that do not decide to have a healthy lifestyle will be marginalized and that call our attention. Something that it's very interesting or was very interesting after the pandemic, because this project started before the pandemic, it was that in this society, it was pretty normal for people to help scientific research and actively participate in clinical trials um, and share their data and uh, allow the government to uh, share their data. And that's something that Angela will talk later. Um, also in this world, there is a strong focus on locally sourced produce. We didn't know if that come out of nationalism or like uh, sustainability, but we thought it was very interesting. And finally, the one that we thought it was more dystopian, we said, oh, there is a high anxiety about the future and the impacts of pandemics and climate change. Um, and people are concerned that a pandemic could happen and here we are. So, could these headlines reflect our world into 2030? So we decided first to confirm that this world that we just portrayed before could become a reality. And we identified four clear signals. So the first signal is that the government 
was actually is actually regulating advertising and packaging probably not as strong as in the scenario but they are actually doing here you are seeing two examples like chile that is removing all the cartoon cartoons to make it attractive for kids from kids food but also the uk government that in um, um, introduced this voluntary traffic labeling system that companies can adopt if they want to sell their food in the UK. The second signal was actually citizens asking for more regulation. This regulation is driven by citizens' concern with child obesity. And Biteback, that is our partner for this project, was like a reflection that this citizen, that this citizen um, concern actually exists. Um, as it is an, a citizen-driven initiative to eradicate child obesity. The, th the third signal is a growing number of buy local campaigns. All around the world, we have seen these campaigns are buy local, uh, uh, buy local for the sake of the planet, please. Uh, but we don't know if actually um, this is because of anti-globalization or if this is because people would like to um, just support their local communities. Next slide. Thank you. This is what I was referring to, like 55% of UK respondents prefer to buy local uh, to support small producers uh, and 32% to avoid pollution from food transportation. So we didn't know, but we thought it was a very good angle there. Uh, this is a um, a survey that was done by the IRA, a European Shopper Insight Survey. Finally, and also there are two more. <laughs> the, th the next one is sustainability driving purchasing choices. So the conversation around sustainability has been for a long time. But the, the thing that accelerated the, the concern in people is the switch on the narrative to being in a climate crisis that was brought by uh, Greta Thunberg, um, the Swedish teenager that led this global climate strike in 50, 150 countries. And finally, the last one is that climate change can actually accelerate pandemics. So we found, okay, there has been some pandemic historically, and we know that this could happen. Um, and scientists have been ringing bells that there are more than 1 million undiscovered viruses in the world that could are zoonetic, that, that comes from the fact that we are destroying our planet. So yes, indeed, this could happen and we are in the middle of one. <laughs> um, so next. So we were able to confirm that there were significant signals that could make this scenario a reality. And now it was time for us to build. So we began by questioning what seems more attractive, what is easier to represent, and how can we convey an impactful message? And which route do we take? Do we explore a dystopian future or a utopian future? And the aha moment came when we were interviewing members of the Bikepack Youth Board. This board was put in place to bring perspective of the youth to put them at the protagonist, um, like put, to put the protagonist of the campaign at the center of their strategy. When interviewing them, we were impressed by how vocal they were about the need for regulation and government intervention. We also noticed how constantly they referred to the need for more healthy options. So we asked them, what does this regulation really mean and what would it look like? And what really defines healthy or unhealthy? We explored firsthand how easy it was to buy foods that were classified as healthy. It is extremely difficult to understand what is actually healthy and what's not because what's healthy for one person may not be healthy for another. The struggle to evaluate uh, healthiness through the current traffic light method is misleading and can be extremely daunting. So based on this experience, we picked uh, the two elements of our provocation. The first one being rebranding of products and the second one, I'm sorry, the second one was rewording of key messages. So this is how we rebranded. We thought about reflecting a future where all unhealthy food packaging uh, is black and white and only healthy food looks good. So we created this artifact to test what people felt about this regulation. We wanted to know if boring packaging could actually prevent them from buying unhealthy food. So we noticed that food packaging can often be misleading and highly processed foods are uh, often disguised and marketed as healthy. So we thought, what if nutritional information was clear and explicit? Uh, I'm sorry, Marion, could you go on to the next slide? Yeah. 
So uh, as you can see, this is what this this was the prototype, and we wanted messaging to be very clear and effective, uh, and not hidden by um, misleading packaging that has extremely beautiful graphics. So uh, would and then we thought like would clear information help people to identify what is healthy and inform them to make better choices, and and lastly, how would they feel if their food actually shamed them for not eating healthy? The next element we targeted was sustainability. As sustainability is a trend, we added this to the packaging, and we wanted to know whether people consider sustainability when they buy food. So, uh, do they know the impact of certain foods uh, on the environment, and and would they choose better if they knew this impact? And so, we introduced glass packaging, jar to enhance the recycle attribute. We also showed the place of origin of products to encourage people to buy local. We tested these prototypes with students and staff from London College of Communication. We asked people how they would feel if supermarkets look like this in the future, and how packaging would affect their uh, shopping habits. So, and does sustainable packaging really um, change their buying habits? So, let's watch this video to see how people reacted. Because it's more minimalistic. It's fine. It's nice, it's colorful, it's attractive. This is so dumb and done. The label is very simple, so I don't know if I'm trying to misleading me. Why I like those words. I, I don't know, I don't really want to catch my attention. You know what the market is like? Idea behind. I would buy the most sustainable, most recyclable, most refillable. Yeah, I know it's not healthy, but I like it. It's, it's, I want to have that. I don't want to have this. And of course, I won't have any good choice, and I will do this. But I want to be happy about it. <laughs> and then it's put the lump of winner. I wasn't in mind. I'll just see it and go for it. Well, this would take a lot longer to. Yeah. But maybe you just buy the necessary stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's a new flavor. Yeah. Future all things you look like this. We used to buy as much as to buy. Because it doesn't affect. I don't care. Okay. I really don't care about the manipulation. I like it. I like the packaging. But if I see this, this is boring. I won't even buy it at all. So as you can see in the video, people were not fully pleased with the regulations, but they understood why those regulations were implemented. Monotonous black and white packaging would surely influence their buying choices, but the transparency of Whole Foods and their labels was was appreciated. However, there are some people who could not be influenced no matter what. And so we thought, how could we amplify aspects of this prototype to provoke even more discussion? We began by crafting a future, and then we amplified aspects of this future that we iterated, and we iterated our artifacts through the feed feedback and insights we gathered from our testing session. We tried to find better ways to challenge people's initial perceptions and create discussion on what this future would look like. At the same time, we added deviances to the system to make a world that is more real and plausible. As we know, when it comes to world building, humans are always hard to predict. Thank you, Ruchika, for going through our process. Um, now I would like to invite you to Supermarket 2030, a future that has been irre irrevocably changed by the trends that we've previously noted for you. Here is what we amplified. So first, our future relies heavily on an increase in government regulations on private food companies. The products we created have been debranded by the government restrictions, only showing this relevant and vetted information that will inform consumer choices. The government has expanded its sugar tax to include all ultra processed foods, while whole foods and processed foods will be comparatively much more affordable. As our future will vehemently battle childhood obesity, the government will also restrict minors from buying ultra processed foods, similar to present protocols around alcohol and cigarettes. This sense of regulation will be further accentuated by this no junk food sign that you see peeking out at the tube. And junk food has become pretty much synonymous with vices like smoking that are kind of looked down by the general public and controlled by restrictive laws. Nextly, through feedback, we 
Um, packages will be simply labeled as whole foods, processed foods, and ultra processed foods. This classification, classification stemmed from our discussion of what healthy and unhealthy meant and how arbitrary the nutritional information on packaging often is. For example, calories, they don't really mean much. In this case, whole and processed foods are deemed healthier due to the amount of processing that they've received. So through feedback, we also knew that price was really important when choosing food. So to lower this barrier and increase the likelihood for consumers to reach for these more healthy products, um, whole foods are cheap while junk food is expensive, as mentioned before. And this concept will also push it back against fast food logic where people often buy fast food because it's seen as a bargain. So this promise that you'll get a lot of food for a very little bit of money and sever this really close link between food insecurity and poverty. Incentivized by the government, supermarkets will create reward programs for shoppers who buy healthier food, giving savings for future healthy groceries. Whole foods are also, oh, sorry, not quite done yet. <laughs> Whole foods are also packaged in glass, as you can see, and it's symbolically and literally hinting that consumers will get what they see. On the other hand, processed and ultra processed foods are hidden behind this monotonous packaging, reflecting the processing that has changed the whole food into something that's less recognizable. Ultra processed food is also only available in these very small serving sizes and are able to take up much less shelf space, flipping the current retail space design that influences how much food we choose to buy. Perfect. Sustainability will also be at the forefront of consumer minds and public and private sector agendas. As climate change is no longer being ignored and affects the mechanisms of human life, government regulation will enforce food companies to include carbon footprint information on each food product and single use plastic packaging will be banned, favoring recyclable or reusable packaging. The Tesco poster hanging on the wall suggests that there will be significant drought seasons due to climate change and businesses and corporations must do their part to adhere to government regulations and maintain customer loyalty. Um, one's shopping basket carbon footprint will also be automatically printed on his or her receipt, suggesting this quota of how much carbon an individual is contributing to through their food choices. As a future society that places this really strong emphasis on collective responsibility, it'll be each individual's obligation to adhere to these societal norms and contribute to the community's overall health. So um, government sanctioned campaigns will recommend citizens against eating ultra processed foods and compromising public health and resources. There'll be this sense of surveillance and public shaming that will reside over shopping shoppers food choices through the use of transparent shopping bags so everyone will be able to see your shopping choices and they might judge you for your food choices even messaging on the receipt from the grocery store drives this sense of social responsibility thanking customers for choosing to buy healthy foods over ultra processed foods so covid amplified a growth growing sense of shopping online, online grocery and grocery delivery services. We realized that our project set in the future would also have to adapt to address this rapidly moving digitization of the current supermarket as well. So saying that, I'd like to invite you to the virtual shopping experience of Supermarket 2030. Great. So reflecting upon this future in the context of our current state of the world, where we're all online, we gained new perspectives of some trends that propelled our project forward. In previous weeks, signals have gotten stronger and some prioritized drivers for change from before may be diverted now. So here are some signals we noticed that will affect our concept. The closing of down of net international borders around the world exposed vulnerabilities of a globalized trade system that now relies very heavily on foreign production. 
So this creates a new demand for localization, such as for certain foods, household products, and PPE, our need to create these more resilient food systems that can withstand supply chain disturbances has never been greater and more championed by the public and governments. Communities have become stronger as our lives have been forced to become more nuclear. So we always hear these heartwarming stories told of neighbors finally getting to know one another and strangers banding together and forming mutual aid for one another. This growth and a sense of community will hopefully continue beyond COVID and may strengthen this future scenario that we have chosen, which calls for a drive towards community governments supported by a strong sense of responsibility to others. The idea of living with as well as a civic responsibility and duty is also exacerbated at the moment where the whole population is being called to stay at home and wear a mask in order to protect one another and particularly the more vulnerable members of the community. So in our future, we had created this world that placed collective responsibility to be a healthy and communal citizen over individuality. These regulations perhaps started with good intentions as they often do, but devolved to encompass the uglier side of human nature, namely that we really can't help ourselves from judging others for their actions. So this has been seen so strongly through the pandemic from tweets about diaper chinning to physical and very loud mask shaming and shows just how capable we are as a society to look down on those who don't conform for the greater good. COVID also increased growing trends for online shopping all over the world. So everyone, including those who were maybe previously resistant to online shopping, has turned to Amazon, profiting billions while everyone remains trapped in their homes. Um, grocery store um, deliveries are booming, often creating long waits and delays for those who are vying for a time slot now. But at the same time, our current situation has also illuminated the importance of neighborhood grocery stores. So despite the stress of going to the grocery store, especially during that first lockdown where we really didn't wanna go, it also offered a small slice of interaction and normalcy within our insular lives. So while other trends may predict that the physical grocery store will disappear with the growing agility and popularity of online shopping, COVID may show us that Though the technology may make this future more feasible, it might also take away a very vital component of our public lives. So now that is kind of the future that we've created and we'd love you to explore what would you feel about living in a world like this? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Angela. And thank you, everyone, um, for sharing your process, uh, sharing everything about this project. I really hope that um, I really hope that you that now the audience sees uh, in this project what I see in it, which is, uh, as I said before, so many layers and so many very, very complex ideas that somehow you managed to uh, pull into one. Um, so without further ado, I am going to have a look at the questions that we received from the audience. Uh, so we have some comments as well. Um, so Lara, Dr. Lara Salinas, uh, whom I really, really want to thank because again, she spearheaded this unit um, and she's been amazing all throughout. I also want to thank uh, Leslie Ann Daly, uh, who's been working with us during this unit. Uh, and I want to obviously like thank all of you, uh, like the team you've done again, like really, really great work. Um, so yeah. Uh, so Lara says, it's really interesting that what looked dystopian and remote uh, in February 2020 became a reality a month later. Um, and that really tells us about the significance of this type of work and to hold these kinds of conversations. And I can't agree more. It is, you have genuinely pointed a few things out and I saw you do that work and I saw you have these predictions and uh, oh wow you were unfortunately right with quite a few things and again I really one of my favorite aspects of this project was your um, your idea of public shaming because for me that's how um, we can use we can create a fictional world that actually functions it's um, when we understand how we can deviate from those regulations. And again, like that was, that was excellent. Um, 
So I appreciate how you, so Lara is still uh, asking, I appreciate how you constructed prototypes, then tested and iterated. What did you learn through this process? Um, I, I can take that one. I guess what we learned is that <laughs> it's very difficult to build artifacts like these prototypes when we were at the beginning where, well, how do we represent this world? How do we do it? And should we do it online? Should we do it like how this physical world, how this thing that we are thinking looks physically? That was super hard. Like we had tons of iterations until we got to the first ones that you saw that we decided to test. But I think um, one of the things that we learned was just make make whatever you are thinking, make it as soon as possible, make it tangible, go out there and let's observe what people say about this. If people can uh, react, scare or react um, positive to what you are saying, like again, the difference with service design is like you are not looking to test if this works, you are looking to test if actually makes this makes people think something. So it's just that switch of mindset when you are doing this versus when you are doing the other, that, that's a great valuable lesson. Thanks, Laura. Uh, does anyone else want to add anything in regards to that question? Um, I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so in kind of building on what Laura was saying, it's like we really struggled first to like understand that idea of just making something to get people's reactions out of it because you just want, like normally we want to test something and make people like it, but instead it was um, trying to see what were those little points that people were pointing out they really didn't like about it and almost how we could amplify those things to make it even more provocative and make them like think like even more about how um, that wasn't a future that they would want to live in and then what is kind of the alternative then. Um, so really trying to push that agenda. And I think that was um, really impactful because it's not a way that we normally test things. So we don't test things to see if people don't like them or not. Thanks, um, that's a really good answer. Um, I have another question here. How do you feel designing futures um, at a time when the world it was changing so rapidly and so dramatically? Um, I can start and then like one of you could answer, but I think the overall feeling that from all of us was that we were designing this thing and we were seeing all these things like a uh, pandemics can be more common in the future. Um, and then we saw that happening. So for us, it it was almost like we're just designed for the present, but uh, this was in the current scenario. Like that's how I felt. It was quite scary at first. I can add something else there. Like, for example, when we were exploring the, the, the portion of sustainability and uh, the buying local um, campaigns and that how anti-globalization could be a thing, the fact that we were like from different countries um, brought uh, things to the table. For example, the first thing that I said was like, but yes, buy local could be very good for you that everyone is buying things here in the UK, but what is gonna happen for people like from Colombia that we depend on this? Like, let's put that as a headline. So it's, it's actually like seeing the, remember first that that future that you are designing could have happened in the past actually, uh, but also trying to uh, think or seeing the signals happening right now in the world. Uh, and that was pretty like scary, especially with the pandemic. At the same time, we were thinking, oh, that this is the one that it, it could happen. Scientists have been telling us for 30 years, but uh, we don't think it's, it's going to be as bad and then poof, pandemic. So, yeah. Um, thanks, Laura and Rajika. Um, I have a, another question. Um, it's it's a simple one, but because you talk so much about um, that that process, what would you say uh, was the most surprising part of the process that you went through? Yes, or from from my opinion, like what surprised me most on during the process is about the feedback and insight. That really was surprised because during the co design workshop with like 
talk a lot with people with different type of people in nationality, occupation, ages, and also the study background. We got a lot of like diverse comment and some of them like and some of them dislike this idea because they don't think it's going to be like for real with the futures. And another thing that was surprised me about the lifestyle of their living and also their mindset as well. Like, I don't really think that people have conscious about the, the their lifestyle this much about the healthiness and also their how good of the food and these people have like read about the description, but on the description is like doesn't explain for real explanation about this this packaging of food. So I think even in the pandemic, it might make people be more concerned more about their healthiness. Like and our project is very relatable in the futures. Um, yeah. And uh, another thing is like from the feedback that I have got so far, it made me realize that people have um, concern and would like to support the local products, food, or whatever about the local more than I expected before. Yep. I, from my perspective, I think the ideation part is quite interesting because it's not like what we did before or maybe we were doing the future. So the world is developing very fast and speculative speculative design is kind of stop and rethink about the change. So, um, and maybe hold to hold it back. So for example, some shopping apps remove the shopping cart function to make people buy things quickly. And uh, when we think about the website, we were thinking to make people uh, super cautious when, we, when they buy things like transfer money to others. So I think it, it's, it's quite interesting to doing something that's very opposite that what we're doing in the workplace. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're getting quite a few questions in, so I'll walk through, uh, I'll walk through them. Um, <clears throat> uh, have you considered at any point during your process uh, do you, uh, to investigate the effect of debranding and healthy food? Um, what, what, that, uh, the effect this would have on business owners, on the corporations behind these healthy foods? Um, I can take that one. So um, we didn't um, actually test with any business owners, but I think we did talk quite a bit about kind of what were all the different effects and how could that change. Um, so I know personally, um, as the daughter of a grocer, that the way um, you set up a store is really important in order to choose what people buy. So for example, you put candy and stuff in the front and people will grab it as soon as they go. And you put anything like that is just filling up a lot of shelf space, people are gonna be more likely to buy it. Um, so just the fact that we are already so governed by all these brands, um, if pr products were debranded and Whole Foods looked much better, that's almost kind of um, pushing people to sell more Whole Foods. So hopefully, um, the grocers and the business owners might be more compelled to sell Whole Foods. And at the same time, um, government incentives in this position will be really important because they'll be the ones that are making Whole Foods less expensive to produce and to, um, and to sell. So hopefully that, that kind of answers this question. I just had something to add to that kind of um, in the policy context, I guess what we've seen with um, smoking and the Stop Smoking campaign in this country, um, and eventually the um, cigarette packets were debranded to this kind of sludge color that they chose uh, specifically because it was like they found it was the least attractive color. Um, and I don't know what the exact stats are, but that kind of debranding exercise did um, dramatically reduce sales for um, tobacco in this country. So I guess um, you can kind of relate that to food and imagine that it might have this, a similar effect. That's a good point. Um, I think that there's a there's a question that's like a progressive. It feels like a progressive kind of question, a normal progression. I mean, natural. Uh, I'd be curious. So one of the the attendees are asking us. I'd be curious if at any point uh, you questioned the concept of supermarkets before diving into the supermarket 2030 concept. Nice phrasing. 
I could start again and then um, you guys can add in. So uh, originally the brief was either supermarkets or corner shops and uh, I mean, supermarkets and corner shops and fast food and also chicken shops. So um, that's how like we explored the future of all three. And uh, then we kind of dived into supermarkets because uh, we also considered how people are shopping online, not just because of the pandemic, but just overall, a lot of people are shifting to online. Uh, but I think we were trying to create an overall experience because we, we knew that a supermarket is a place where all people go to. So you, like a child may not go in alone, but there are like supermarkets are set up in such a way that certain products are directed to children. And because we were specifically looking at reducing childhood obesity by 2030, we thought um, supermarkets would be like a good place to start. Thank you, Rishika. Um, and uh, I can move on to another question unless you, you have a, okay, thank you. Um, so we have another question. Uh, Okay, from uh, from Vanessa, um, who's asking, what well, if there would be no supermarkets as physical spaces as we know them? Um, I know you've touched on this a little bit in your in your presentation, and you were saying that there is a kind of a ritualistic aspect and uh, and safe, uh, comfortable aspect to supermarkets. So, what's your take on uh, okay, no supermarkets as physical spaces? that we know already how they could evolve, change, look and feel different. If you're looking at kind of current trends with um, these like futuristic ideas about supermarkets, there are these, now there are these Amazon shops that you don't have to take any kind of payment method in. Um, so I guess supermarkets are evolving and changing. Um, I think looking at 2030, one of the things we really wanted to be careful of is that it's 10 years time is a long way away, but it's not that long a way away. Um, so in order to, for the kind of um, provocation to be slightly believable and realistic, we had to make sure that we weren't kind of going into this um, crazy future full of flying cars and things. And kind of, um, I think to be able to make a successful provocation, you do have to kind of um, base a lot of that on what is real at the moment in order for it to really like capture people's imaginations. Um, so, yeah, I, we didn't really um, explore kind of that aspect. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in. Yeah, I would like to add something. I, I, and this is a lesson that we learned at the same time. Like, it's way easier to become dystopian. It's way easier to portray something that people get scared and then you go super like um, to the stream and that is super easy. But we chose it because we had four scenarios and there were there was one scenario that was very dystopian and we didn't choose it on purpose because we thought this is way more interesting. There are things here that we are seeing and we have seen in the past. And, you know, as um, a stream ride was a thing of the past and white supremacist was a thing of the past, like 40 years ago, and now we are seeing it. Our perspective was that the, the, the future is always evolving. Like it's like things are repeating and we thought, okay, as Laura said, like it's so important to anchor it in some sort of reality and keep it uh, here so people can actually see the small tweaks that we want to add on it, like the shame and all of these that we were more interested to explore rather than exploring the concept uh, of or challenging the concept of supermarket. But I think it's worth it as well, because with the current pandemic, of course, everything is moving online. So, yeah, it's worth it. It's just that we didn't do it for this project. Thank you, Lara. I think you've made a very valid point um, with that. The fact that it is so easy to uh, fall into a dystopian project, especially when we're working with speculative design as a tool. Um, speculative design as a practice has brought many projects which show very often um, very great dystopias um, as an alarm system. But it is also possible to kind of understand nuances. And I think that's something you've done very well in your project. Um, I'm not just saying nice thing for the sake of it. I believe it. Um, but it is true that it is easy to fall into that. Everything is going to be terrible, um, completely terrible. There is no silver lining. Your project was, again, very nuanced. And I think you've done a great job of actually understanding things, uh, the good and the bad. and 
understanding the human nature and how it can evolve um, naturally. So let's have a look at other questions. Um, so we have another question from the audience. We're, we're bombarded with attention-seeking marketing and visuals from all shelves of the supermarket, but your imagined future packaging goes the other way. Uh, oh, it disappeared. Um, <laughs> sorry, the question disappeared. Um, okay, I have it. Do you do you think uh, do you think the the, the very kind of uh, the branded uh, where you presented um, your your products the completely uh, white? Um, I think the the person is qualifying kind of kind of qualifying as uh, utilitarian visuals. Um, how would it affect the human psyche? Would it be a, a negative effect in the long run? I can start with this. Um, I don't like obviously none of us are psychologists, um, but you can already see these trends kind of happening in different places. Like, for example, like uh, The Ordinary, which is like a skincare shop. It's very, very minimalistic, like Aesop, different places like that. They're all already using aesthetics like this. And I think that people are actually being drawn to them. Um, I think that there's kind of this push and pull um, in society of going minimalistic and then going maximalistic. And I was actually reading something recently about how after recessions often, or during recessions, people go very maximalistic. You're seeing on um, fashion shows, these like giant heels um, that are just completely outlandish and don't make any sense because, and apparently heel size grows depending on recession or, uh, um, if it's prospering, a smaller heel, <laughs> like they choose to buy that. Um, and I think it goes with what we see around us. And if we're seeing so much chaos in the world, then we don't really want to see something so crazy. And another study I think we looked at was um, that people don't actually want so much um, selection. Like we think we want so much selection. And then you get proposed with 50 different types of ice cream. And you're like, I just wish there was three and I could choose because I've stood here for half an hour. <laughs> um, so I think that that's part of it, but definitely like graphic design is a huge part of our world. And um, I think it would definitely make us miss it as well. No, it, is, it was an interesting question, um, especially considering I, I liked uh, the use of utilitarian visuals. Um, I mean, that is definitely the vibe that you were going for, I think. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the health of the individual over the, the quick happiness of, uh, uh, of this food. Uh, Ruchika, did you have something to add on this? Yeah, I actually want to say that um, what happens is that when you go into the supermarket and you check a product, it'll say almost all of them, if you especially look at drinks, they're going to say no sugar. And then you're going to think that it's no sugar, but then you actually check the sugar content behind it and it's got loads of sugar. It's just not got added sugar in it. And um, that can be very misleading. And that's something that uh, a lot of these like fat diets and all are playing on. So they say no sugar is good for us. This is good for our body. And uh, that's something that we wanted in our provocation that we didn't want this misleading and this um, fad to come into the product because that can be really damaging for individuals. So we just wanted something that tells you honestly what it is and that, that's all. Yeah, Maria, one more thing, if, yeah. if you allow me. Like, really? we, we saw it in the video, like people, people were reacting like, oh, this is ugly, this makes me sad. And, and we saw it and we, Keep it there because it's good to con co to have those construct of opinions. Like we weren't designing something for people to think in the way we want them to think. We want them those uh, uh, reactions, right? Uh, and we thought, okay, this is pretty interesting because uh, we all want, like, we are very vocal, like about, we want more regulations. Yes, let's do it. The government is not doing enough. But then when the regulation comes, how do you feel about that? And what are the other consequences? And, and that's the conversation that we wanted to trigger. Um, so that's why also we selected this white plain thing. Thank you. Um, I have another question, uh, which is, it seems as though uh, shaming might have a few negative knock-on effects. Did you consider rewarding or praising? And if so, what made you select shaming? I know you've touched on this a little bit in the in the talk that you have different reward systems. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit more about them? Yes. Um, actually, we have the uh, 
the reward system is on the uh, recipe receipt, but it's not very, very uh, strong shows on the PowerPoint. So um, the reason we choose the shin because it's kind of strong to point our point, our idea of it. Um, so what we do in this project is not only about like doing pre produce something, but also to kind of provocative to make people think things. So we choose kind of strong shaming part to make them think about this. Thank you. I think that something else we looked at um, was, um, for example, like the positives of this collective society. I think like when we were first reading the scenario of collective responsibility, we were thinking like, great, like what's wrong with this um, future? Like it looks pretty good so far. Like I don't know where we can pull that dystopia from, um, but it is, um, I just totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, but I think that it's very true that um, part of our future was also this idea that like neighbors would be able to cook for one another or something. Like there was um, in one of the photos in the background, the ad was like, help your neighbor, like make food for your um, neighbors when they're busy, like make sure that their kids are eating healthy. So there was supposed to be this really positive aspect of it as well. And I think that that would shine through in that future. But then obviously I think as humans, we tend to gravitate towards negativity. You know, we see like, um, that's what like draws us when we're looking at the news. Um, it kind of pulls our attention, which is why we chose to amplify that because we know that people would be more kind of shocked by that than being like, everything is really great. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing as well, it, it's the fact that, that that's the, the perfect deviation, like, oh, this is a regulation that we all asked for. We wanted for this and it's going to be perfect. This is the policy that the government is going to do. We asked for it. Yeah, thank you, government. And then what are the consequences or the side effects of that policy that also we want them people to reflect on that. So shaming was one of those that was easy for us to represent specifically because the scenario uh, had a, a portion of civic duty and what how people behave, we reflected a lot on how people behave when they have a civic duty to do something. Uh, and we, we chose that because of that. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Uh, Frank, go on. I would, like, I would like to ask something like we have thinking about the reward system as well, because we have to believe that um, in the society we live in like something that people have to have like the profit as well, not just only like from the giver or whatever. So whenever you use like the sustainable stuff, like or buy the, the green labels on the products, you're gonna get like extra point to use like for the, ex um, for, the for your shopping like that. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for maybe a couple more questions that I have there. Um, first off, uh, I think still talking, thinking about that speculative design process. Um, what do you think is the value of this speculative design process within a service design project? You, we usually see speculative design in a very different contexts, for example, in galleries, and they're presented as in between artistic and design projects. So how, how did using this contribute to your understanding um, of service design? I can start very short. Uh, I think uh, we all need as a society to cultivate long-term thinking. And speculative design helped you to reflect on that. We, as service designer, we are constantly pushed to create services, to create products, new, 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 new things, this linear economy. And we need to start cultivating this, how these services and products that I'm putting out there or processes, whatever I'm putting out there, it's gonna impact future generations. It's gonna impact the world around me. How this thing that I designed that I thought it was fantastic and with my best intentions created these outcomes. Uh, and I feel that's a practice that we should all acquire and a speculative design help us on that. So it's not about uh, like a science fiction that I agree it's pretty cool, uh, but a lot of people get scared, like, why am I gonna do this? This is unprofessional, I don't wanna do this. But actually it's very relevant. It's very relevant that you create or think in long-term uh, aspects of your project. And I think it's fundamental for every service designer, I would say. I, I was just gonna add something to that. Like, 
I think speculative design has got huge potential to be used in the policy uh, in the policy sphere as well. Um, in that same kind of um, what you were saying, Laura, like about how we need to not think about our services that we're running and also our policies that we have in this really short term way. And I think that speculative design can really bring in um, a kind of foresight to policy design um, in a really valuable way. Um, I think just one last thing as well is like it also is against idealistic thinking. I think it's so easy as designers to just have this positivity about like, well, I designed it and I really love it. And like, I had really great intention that it's going to be great. Like, <laughs> it's so often that we don't think the other way around. It's like, well, what if it fails? Like, what if we don't know how to predict humans? And I think that like many problems in the past have been created because of these really good intentions that they didn't actually think about humans or humans are deviants. We're going to do things that you don't expect us to do. So you can't really prepare for everything and you can't expect that it's going to go the only way that you see it. We have to explore these various different futures. That is, that is a really, really good point to make in talking about um, intentions. Uh, often that is an issue with all sorts of designers, uh, starting with the best of intentions. And as we say, that is what hell is paved with. Um, and uh, did anyone else have anything to add to this question? Um, so funny, uh, Laura Leahy mentioned policy making because um, for, my, for our last question, um, I wanted to ask you, so as you, you mentioned before, part of your goal um, is to open up a conversation about what the future of food could look like. Since you, you, you studied all these trends and you've worked on this topic, um, would you mind telling me a little bit about what does the future of food look like to you? And especially, um, do you think you would be able to articulate the importance of food related policy making in this future? I can start and then if anybody else wants to jump in, that'd be great. Um, so I think that um, it's really, really important. Like we need to look at our food and I think that it has shown, it's sh shown so much during COVID that um, we haven't been thinking about our food enough. And I think that there are lots of people that are talking about this, about how our food chains have become so industrialized and we're so disconnected from our food. So how can um, we change that and how can we make sure that there is more government regulation um, to support people and support children from not reaching for the thing just because it looks beautiful and because it's flashy. Um, there's definitely a lot of room for government to intervent there. Um, and it's what we learned from Bite Back was that it's an entire kind of um, uh, mindset shift like we can't think about it as it being kind of this individual responsibility that we need to just choose what we have and we need to make good choices about it it's that there's kind of more to be done in terms of education in terms of um, making people feel closer to their food and making people feel like they understand what they're eating and not just a bunch of different ingredients on the back that make no sense that we don't even know what they are um, and in terms of food policy, I think that's really important to start looking at that and making sure that um, we're factoring in um, these different these different aspects about government re like regulation, and then also making sure that it's not um, that it could go the wrong way. So being clear that yes, we want government regulations, but we want these to be very meaningful and very intentional government regulations that really promote. Um, aren't just like a quick band-aid solution but that really address the systemic issues behind it. I think to add to that is um, an interesting point that Bite Back make around how we communicate problems like childhood obesity and talking talking about specifically about childhood obesity as a problem is not the right thing to do and I think that by speculating on how like especially this project um, I guess this is kind of highlighting the future that Bite Back don't want where, where there is this like blame culture of if you're um, overweight or obese it's your fault it's 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 your individual decisions that you've kind of um, made and it's actually the a lot of the discourse is more about okay how can we support an atmosphere that will support people to make those choices themselves um, so I think um, yeah there, there is this kind of aspect of like language that used um, in public and also in like policy making spheres as well. Yeah mm -hmm. I'd like to add to that um, so this is another thing that came from Bike Back and they were talking about how um, 
childhood obesity is always blamed on the parents but that's not always the case because um, parents most often don't have the support uh, from brands and just from the government to be able to make their make decisions to help their kids so i think like Laura said i think it's really important to have these kind of regulations but obviously not things that are enforced on you but things that help you uh, to actually bring about change thank you um anyone else uh, oh, so we have Lara. Um, so Dr. Lara Salinas that I've mentioned before, uh, who spearheaded this unit and who said that now this talk is now on the essential reading list of the of the unit. So it appears I'll be teaching that in a month. Um, thank you, thank you all so much. Um, I know some quite tough questions have been asked today, and uh, I'm really impressed with all your work and all your answers. You've done uh, some tremendous work and you were able to really tackle these questions which show true understanding of your projects uh, of your project and of the work you've done um, so again thank you uh, to everyone who's come here to watch us talk about weird food futures um, and thank you to uh, Tommaso and February who are behind the scene supporting this event thank you uh, to how uh, to everyone who made this event possible um, and to yeah to everyone who worked on the global design futures unit to bite back and the social design institute um, but yes thank you thank you everyone don't forget to go and and see uh, the, the the students portfolios and to go have a look and have a little play around um to per market 20 uh, 2030 website um, please do join us in uh, virtually applauding everyone. Uh, I'm just going to actually applaud for a second. Um, but yes, um, go and check out uh, all the service design work. And uh, yes, thank you for taking part. And uh, everyone may now leave the session. Thank you so much, Marion. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Marion. <laughs> thank you, Marion. <laughs> thank you, bye. <laughs>